so let's see. What does anybody see? Anything? Yes. See it all. You see the whole screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, here's my experiment. If I go to full screen, will you, will I get rid of this um, bar across the top? Let's see if that works. Then it's just pure slides. Uh, the bar across the top is still there, but okay. So you got the slide number one, right? Who can see this transcript recording on blah, blah, blah. Okay, you can all see this. I can't hear anyone say yes. Oh, you guys all muted. Yes. We're muted. You're all muted. Okay, yeah. all right. I won't call, I won't keep asking you stuff. <laughs> I get it. Okay. What I want to do is get to the end of these slides and then start to come back. And when I'm coming back the other direction is when I'll jump to some other screens. But now I'm just going to stick to the slides and do this. This is a slideshow I present frequently um, also on YouTube. And so I always present it as some something that you too might present. In other words, kind of like when you go to a folk song meetup any song you hear potentially, especially if you're a guitarist or can sing, you're listening because, oh, I might, I might be able to sing this. And I'm trying to treat, it's not the way we do it ethnically, it's not the way we do PowerPoints, but I'm trying to think of how to sort of send out a presentation with my name on it as kind of sheet music. And then other people can just pick it up and use it in another way. But, and I've had some success with this. I've got at least two people excerpting or sort of starting to use my slides and no one's done the whole show. Now this one, I did take this picture myself. This is what I call my bio slide. And this is where I just tell some story about myself. So y'all told me some things. I'll tell you like a quick story from my life. This is of course, St. Louis. And for a while there, I would get to go to St. Louis. I'd fly here there from Portland, rent a car, some friends I know there put me up for a night. Then I would drive north to Champaign-Urbana where Wolfram is and a small company called User Active had kind of branched off of Wolfram, University of Illinois. They wanted to teach calculus using Mathematica. Of course, that's Wolfram's flagship. And so they were purchased uh, eventually by O'Reilly Media. And that's where I met these people. And I became a Python teacher for O'Reilly, which was trying to start a school by swallowing this thing called user active in Champaign-Urbana. So my coworkers were in Champaign, a lot of them. So I would drive there, turn right, and head all the way across Illinois to um, all the way across Indiana too, to Richmond, Indiana, on the border with Ohio and visit with my daughter. And she was going to Richmond, uh, she was going to Earlham College, a Quaker college there at that time and to wrap up this story once my mom joined us i think for a wilf meeting women's international league for peace and freedom up in detroit and we all drove together from richmond up to detroit and coming back i remember tara and i my daughter and i stopped at a geodesic dome mosque you may have seen it in the literature but halfway between like near toledo and i don't have his picture handy but like the Climatron and that were both kind of on the same pilgrimage. Plus, I got to see the Midwest, make little side trips, see places like Decatur, places I'd never been. And I think about the Midwest, very much into music there. I was amazed. Partly one of my coworkers could show me the scene. But, you know, people get on a bus in Memphis and just drive, you know, just for the night to play in a jazz club or something. So... What is synergetics? I, I would also say maybe on this dome picture, surprisingly, this is probably the last picture of a dome. And as people in the slide deck, as you move into synergetics, you're kind of thinking, oh, that's the Bucky Dome stuff. And yet I'm not focusing on the domes. I'm saying domes happen when you start with spheres. Domes come from spheres and spheres come from when you start spinning the polyhedra. You spin them you start getting your spheres. This is pre-sphere almost. We're not spinning yet. Like I'm getting back to where synergetic starts. We'll get to spinning. 
So what is synergetics? The graphic on the right, I'm kind of proud of. Early on, I taught myself to make sort of animated GIFs and stuff. So I never had to worry about getting permission to use them. What's controversial here? I've just been going through cosmic fishing again. It really was hard to digest. It's not an easy book. I think we all agree. And possibly what's controversial here is maybe me claiming it for the humanities. Like, is that really true? Because it looks so geometric, right? But uh, it is still, I'd say the jury is out in some ways. And that's the feeling people have about it. If they know about it at all, which few people do actually, it's gotten to be very esoteric. So this slide I used to kind of set up the tension of how could this be true? How could, how could synergetics work? And the idea that a tetrahedron is a third the volume of a cube, that's nothing Bucky discovered. That's been known and it's far more general than that, right? It's any parallel of high peak. You can do all kinds of stuff, just keep that parallelograms going and you've got that one third relationship. So that's not new. But Fuller wants to make that his unit of volume. And that sounds doable at first, because you know you can make anything any size, right? You can grab a tetrahedron and size it appropriately to where it equals the same amount of water in your unit cube. And you can pour them back and forth and they fill each other. What was the problem there? Is that all we're doing? The answer is not, it's not all we're doing, because the edge length of this second root of two edge length of this cube is incompatible onwards. Um, it's incompatible with that being a unit volume because we all learn in school and we all know the second root of two times itself times itself to the third power, that's what we call cubing, that would be the volume of that cube. And without doing any calculation, we know that's a rational number. And if the tetrahedron is a third of that, it's not gonna be one, it's gonna be something weird. And yet Fuller is trying to peg the edge length at two or one. That's what these spheres are saying is you can say diameters or radii. So you immediately double the edge to two if, <coughs> excuse me, if you're doing radii. So this slide kind of sort of poses a tension. It's like, well, this whole thing's broken right out of the gate. The math is broken. I'm not gonna ever understand this, Bucky. Where are we going with this? And then on the next slide, I hint that there is a solution that we're gonna look at a different way of, we're not gonna use the same way to multiply. We're not gonna use the cube quite the same way or the tetrahedron. Use the tetrahedron instead, what does that even mean? But there's light at the end of the tunnel, maybe. It's like, I've got your attention back. Maybe there's a solution here. And then for the next bunch of slides, I'm showing where he's going with this, right? So the tetrahedron and the whole idea of four dimensional and all this is different to our ears. It's a different way of talking. He's here, he's like making fun of quote, geometers and schooled people speak of length, breadth and height as con constituting a hierarchy of three independent dimensional states. It sounds overblown, but then that's kind of how it is. You know, you learn this as a kid. And if you do have objections, really everyone's beating it into you and they're older than you. So you can't really defend yourself as a kid. And no one later goes back and ever questions it because by then you understand it. But he's saying, no, you can't have height, width and depth separate. It's all at once, space is space. You cannot think of width without breadth. You can imagine you can think of it but you're looking at it, whatever you're looking at. So you're already got your depth and everything. It's all there. However, you can have long, thin things and blah, blah. You can have topology. And by the way, the most primitive, simplest volume, if we're doing straight edge modeling, is gonna be the cage of six edges. And for, um, you know, it's simpler than the cube anyway. So he's making all these points. And so, hey, if there is a way to make the tetrahedron important as the cube is in terms of multiplication and volume and stuff, maybe there's a payoff. So then the next few slides are like, oh yeah, if we can get over that hump and have tetra volumes, think in terms of tetrahedral volumes with a nice edge of one or two, then these other shapes come into focus. Now, you know, the deal, it's like the long diagonal, 
of um, the rhombic dodecahedron is the same as the red edge of the octahedron, so on, color coded. Uh, you can make little paper models and the kids, the kids love it. You can pour the beans back and forth. Two cubes of volume three make a uh, rhombic dodecahedron of volume six, octahedron volume four. It's fun, right? It's easy. You can remember it. Suddenly all these other polyhedra come into focus as having whole number of volumes, and then you can fraction them up, break them apart. You got A modules, B modules, you know that you know the deal, right? This is all in synergetics. And then once you've got that, you can access some sort of abstruse aspects of mathematics that Somerville, Goldberg, big mathematicians, you know, spent careers trying to figure out what tetrahedrons fill space without left or right handed, just directly as themselves, just clone me, give me a whole box of me, and I will fill space without gaps. What tetrahedrons do that? And of course, regular tetrahedrons don't do that, but irregular tetrahedrons, some of them do, how many? And that's a conversation. And if you learn Fuller's vocabulary, you learn how to say might, right, bite, quarter right, and half right. Those are the five until Goldberg found these infinite families, which I'm still looking for a good model. Three families. Anyway, coupler is also unit volume. So we've got a culture going here. We got a kind of a math. And okay, so there were A and B modules. There's also T and E modules. And how do, what are they? We are carving up a rhombic tricontahedron, but that ball there is the IVM ball, the the CCP ball, that's the space filling ball, the, the reference ball that we all use. When I say diameter and radius, we've already seen these balls before. That's one of them. It's one of the unit radius balls. And this completely it precisely wraps such the diamond face centers touch it exactly. So it's completely tangent. The volume of this thing is just a tad over five, amazing, just a tad over. And the mathematical transformation to bring it down to exactly five is down at the bottom there, 0.99994. And I've got a closed form expression for that with phi and we bring phi back. Uh, I know Fuller purged synergetics of all Greek letter math, but second generation here, we're bringing back phi at least. Um, so there's the five rhombic tricontahedron and the five plus, and these are both in synergetics. One's made of T modules, uh, because, and, and you see the T is 1 24th, same as the A and the B. A, B, and T all have the same volume. There's tiny little more volume for the E. How tiny? That's how tiny. This is right from synergetics. It's like, oh my God, there's this volume five rhombic tricontahedron. It's like razor thin, different from if we just are tangent to the sphere. That's interesting. He's like the only one who knows this because he's doing this in tetra volumes. Everything makes, it only works when you're doing this in tetra. When I say five, volume five, I'm talking about five tetrahedrons, right? So people are getting the sense that there's something going on. This last module now, so we had A, B, I went by them quick, A, B, T, E, and this is called the S. And that outer octahedron, you've seen this before, it's not his discovery that this nesting kind of thing can happen. <laughs> Somebody's unmuted. So this um, octahedron is the volume four octahedron. It's the one I showed much earlier. The edges are the same as the tetrahedron's edges. So that icosahedron inside is smaller than the one we're used to from the jitterbug. When we do the jitterbug, of course, we're used to 12 spheres around one, right, closest packing. And that's kind of our beginning point for the jitterbug. And then we squeeze it down to the, you know, you know the drill, squeeze it down to the octahedron of volume four, right, this guy. So it's the icosahedron inside of that, that is what I'm showing here. And if you add the S modules to that icosahedron, those are the bricks you need, 24 S modules, 12 left, 12 right handed pack them around that icosahedron and you're back to the um, volume four octahedron. So what no one kind of realized in synergetics one and two, but is true, is that the ratio of the volume of the S to the E module is the same 
as the ratio of this cube octahedron to the icosahedron. So you can think of multiplying this 20 volume by the so-called S factor or one over the S factor, and it shrinks down to the octahedron. But then there's another transformation where the sides are allowed to change length. You start with the cube octahedron inside this very same um, octahedron and you torque it so that all the faces stay flush, but the, the sides get a little longer. So you're starting with a 2.5 cube octahedron and you rotate all the faces a little bit, flush with the octahedron. And finally you get this icosahedron. So it's kind of like another kind of jitterbug. It's a cube octahedron to icosahedron uh, transformation. And what I wanted to just say about that is two times application of the S factor. So S factor times the S factor, S factor to the second power times that smaller cube octahedron gives you the volume of the larger icosahedron. Both of them faces flush in the volume four or in any octahedron. Really, once you get this transformation, it doesn't matter the scale. So now that you know what the S module is and the E module is sort of, or they're within your grasp, you can start to look at these Kosky identities here. A capital S is just the S module itself. S, small s three means phi down. So if you think of like beer mugs, if you had a beer mug and all the edges go up by phi, 1.618, you got a much bigger beer mug. The volume went up as a third power of that, phi to the third power. So S3 is the S module, but phi up. That's capital S3. Small S3 is phi down. So you have this succession of S modules. What are S modules? That shape right there that's highlighted. So think of phi scaling those up and down. You can now express the volumes of all these uh, polyhedra in terms of sums of phi scale S's and E modules. S and E mixed together. These happen to all be S, but there's some E's that come in. Now, how do I get the volume of any of these tetrahedrons? Remember those plane nets of the A's, the B's, they all have plane nets. You probably know we, for, for eons, we've had ways to compute the volume of a tetrahedron just from its edges. Forget about coordinates, forget about, just give me the, the edges. Throw it into a formula like Heron's formula for flat triangles, and I'll get back the volume. Now, Gerald de Jong on a train in Amsterdam somewhere figures this all out analytically, but then he um, then he um, lost his notes, but I coded it in a computer fine and then so did he and it's worked always. And it gives back direct tetra volumes. There's no constant here, no funny one over 166 like Piero de, de Fierro's Francesca's, Piero della Francesca. But it turns out Piero della Francesca's can be modified as can the Cayley Menger determinant. Both can be modified to give tetra volumes easily and they look fine, they look good, they work. So the whole tetra volumes thing, we can compute directly from links. And so we've got Python doing that. We've got the regular jitterbug and then all the benefits of thinking of rhombic dodecahedron space filling surrounding each sphere having volume six. So easy, volume six, nobody's teaching that. And Dr. Loeb, he's excited, actually his colleague is excited running up to him after his talk saying, to hell with the unit cell. In other words, we're always trying to teach crystallography where that shape in the middle, that's the CCP, that's the sort of home base for crystallography. But they try to make you imagine it in terms of cubes. This is so much more natural so much easier. And so, my goodness, why don't we teach it like this? But we do in my high school, my school of tomorrow, YouTube channel and so forth, this is what it looks like. Oh yeah, Alexander Graham Bell. So we're not threatened by this. Oh my God, Bucky just copied him. No, great minds think alike. We would be worried if more people didn't understand about the octet trust. Sam Lanahan understands about the octet trust. This is his flex tegrity version. Long story I could tell about Sam and his projects. Now, this is XYZ coordinate system. Now, just look at how many spokes it has compared to what we call the Caltrop. You can just see there's more. I mean, they say this is three-dimensional, but they only count half of their things or, 
you know, you've got three positive basis vectors, three negative. So it ends up being six spokes, no matter how you classify it. Whereas Caltrop has only four. And can you think of dividing space into fewer than four quadrants? This is eight octants here. This is only four quadrants. So we can, if we like, make a coordinate system. You can call it Caltrop coordinates. And uh, it looks like this. And this is not in synergetics. I don't pretend it's his Bucky's and I don't really pretend it's mine. It emerged from a lot of people and a bunch of us have been working on it. And at the sort of heyday of quadres, as I call them, even the math forum, which is very mainstream, had this page taking people to, to study them if they wanted. And they're in Wikipedia and everything's cool. And I've got them working in Python and they're helpful for doing graphics. And what turns out to be true is all the points of, you could say the non-fivefold symmetric concentric hierarchy are simple vector sums of quadrates. In other words, the four basis quadrates are to the corners of the edge two or edge one tetrahedron. So they themselves are not unit, but there are four of them. And the inverse tetrahedron, even though they point the other way, it's all positive coordinates. So it's four coordinates per point, not three, but you don't need negative numbers. It's all positive numbers. And one of them zero always, because in these quadrants, there's always a quadrant you're not using, right? Think of a point floating anywhere in space. It's gonna take a mixture of the three vectors added together tip to tail to find that point. But there's always one quadrant that it doesn't contribute. They're, they're, it's not in that quadrant. So that coordinate zero. There's always a zero, at least one. So they take some fun getting used to, but they work just like X, Y, Z. So they're really fun to use with X, Y, Z, not in contrast or not like we're trying to move, move in, we're trying or push out, we're trying to share um, another way of thinking. Now we're, we're gonna wind up, let's see how am I doing on time. Okay, and then I'm gonna go backwards uh, and show you uh, some side trips, I think. Okay, so this is a quote from Regular Polytopes by Cox, our geometer to whom synergetics is um, dedicated, uh, Chauvin, Siobhan, Siobhan Roberts, wrote King of Infinite Space. She joined us on Trib Tab Book Club a few weeks ago. She also wrote the bio, uh, a bio of John Horton Conway. She was fun to have on, and there's some, I guess you could call it gossip in The King of Infinite Space about the relationship between Coxeter and Fuller. It's interesting. It's a story. If one had time, one could get into it more. There's a lot to say. But here, this is just Coxeter by himself, and he's trying to show, he's trying to disambiguate between two meanings of 4D, you could say. There's his meaning, the Euclidean meaning where you can have any number of dimensions, ND. It's like machine learning. In fact, it is, it's linear algebra. All the dimensions are treated the same. And then there's Einstein and that 4D. And that's a whole different 4D. It's different mathematically. Time is not treated the same as XYZ. It is Minkowski space, all that stuff. So there's two meanings of 4D already. And here's Coxeter saying, hey, don't confuse my stuff with the Einstein stuff. Science fiction writers do, and they do it on purpose. But a tesseract is not a time machine. That's what I tell people, all right? Because Einstein is, fourth dimension is time, X, Y, Z plus time, 4D. That's not what Coxer is doing. That's not polytopes, that's not. So there's already two meanings of 4D. Now what's true is Fuller's just coming along with another one. Once you have two, why can't you have three? And he comes late in life, he publishes Synergetics, when he's pretty old, 75, 1975, 1979. So it doesn't really, I wouldn't say become common usage, but given my background, philosophy, Princeton, Rorty, I get to talk about Wittgenstein and stuff. Like I've had enough background where I get to kind of throw my weight around in that space. And we talk about language games and the foundations of mathematics have plenty of room for multiple uses of 4D. It's like sandcastles on the beach. Each one has its own axiomatic or definitional foundation. You could say 
Synergetics doesn't really have axioms, but you can sort of say it does too. This, this slide shows like, what if you could multiply this way? Well, you can. And if I were doing these slides again today, I would add slides here, but I'm leaving these slides as they are. They're not perfect. I would go to uh, Wayne Roberts in Australia and he proves this to himself, that this is true. You can just go up the sides four by three or seven by 10. And that's gonna be the area in terms of little triangles. So we're not doing squares now. So this works in area. It also works in tetrahedrons, right? And here I would have a different picture or another picture. I have come up with better pictures, but this is from my Martian math storyboard. And that's a huge tetrahedron. You can see it's chained to the desert. Uh, and there's a little runway off to the right. And the Martians, come to earth and they think in terms of synergetics, unit tetrahedron is native to them. And the earthlings and the Martians decide to get together. This is just a science fiction story that helps teach stuff. It's a didactic science fiction. They decide to build a hydroelectric dam together. And so you get to teach about electric uh, principles, gener generators, AC, DC, all that stuff. So it's a hard nosed curriculum designed to teach, but the synergetics is there because the Martians are into this way of, see, that's supposed to be a dam. That's a very primitive picture. Martians and earthlings working together to build this dam. And the way synergetics gets into the curriculum through this story, is just, you know, you could make a cartoon out of it, you can make a movie, is how do the Martians think about things? And here's uh, what's called a Tetra book. Two uh, flaps open and one, book, one page could flap back and forth arc from one to the other. So it makes two complementary tetrahedrons of equal volume. If you stop it where all the edges are the same, that's Fuller's unit, that's synergetics unit of volume. If you make it stand up straight, in other words, if you make that red page go vertical, it just so happens that that tetrahedron has the same volume as a cube with edges R. So if you just look at the Tetra book, you could say earthling civilization, this right tetrahedron is what they think of unit volume, except they remold it and make a clay cube with our edges. We on Mars, we just do this uh, regular tetrahedron. That was what we always did. But the earthlings are weird. So part of this course is as earthlings, I have to train them to think the way Martians think so that they can communicate. You know, the <laughs> So now we have a sense, this is like back to the first slide. It's like, okay, you get it. There's a way, the way it works here. And I show the synergetics constant is early in Fuller's work, 1950s. By the way, the synergetics constant is the ratio between these two. It's like Canadian dollars and American dollars. They're not that different. American dollars are a little bit um, worth a little more because this cube actually has slightly greater volume than this tetrahedron, believe it or not. Even though the edges are only half the length of that tetrahedron, it's 1.06066 more in volume. So that's kind of the exchange rate between these two systems of volume. And once you've got the fuller way of doing it, then you've got all these benefits. Other numbers, other volumes become whole numbers and so on. So here's Darcy Thompson. This is a choice quote. I found it in the Huffington Post, and it's, or someone found it and put it in the Huffington Post, Susan Mazur, and it's Darcy Thompson writing to Alfred North Whitehead in 1918. And he's like, why do we say space is 3D? If I were floating along with no sense of gravity, I really would think it's four dimensional. Uh, it says that right here. He even mentions a tetrahedron, I think. So this, I don't think he would have known anything about Fuller in 1918, you get that right so this intuition that fuller there we got trihedral quad you know he's got all the jargon this guy's you know darcy thompson right here's carl manger geometry of lumps and he's in this book back when einstein was still considered a philosopher philosopher scientist we don't really have that now philosophers kind of pushed einstein out um, uh, as far as their department, you know, being what you have to read to be a philosophy person does not include Einstein anymore. But anyway, back to this book in 1949, here's Carl Menger, who's a dimension theorist, Vienna Circle. Anyway, he's mixed up with that 
Austrian um, Renaissance, Wittgenstein, same thing. He's talking about how we could have a geometry where everything's the same dimension. You've got dots, you've got rods, you've got surfaces, but they're not distinguished by dimension number. They're all made out of clay, you could say. Call it a geometry of lumps. Well, this is exactly what Fuller is doing. And when he says pre-frequency 4D, he means before you add energy to the picture, before you add frequency, it's just 4D. It's just a tetrahedron rolled out or made into a pancake or whatever you want to do. It's all 4D. And then he develops what I think is very telling in synergetics is an opening passage 250 point something, I think called the remoteness of the synergetics vocabulary. Bucky was very aware of the fact that he was taking our common vocabulary out of the dictionary and making his own thing, right? He used the words differently and it was an invisible tug of war. He kind of says in that passage between me and the scientists, if I would let them keep their word or if I'm gonna use it, I think I have just as much right, this whole thing. So yeah, he bends language, he bends meaning and that's why I say it's a work in the humanities and why, you know, better read James Joyce first and then read Synergetics, read Finnegan's Wake and then read Synergetics, right? Now this Escher was maybe gonna be a collaborator, we're told. Dr. Loeb was trying to get them together, but Escher passed away, but there is the IVM. There's the world we're talking about. That's Darcy Thompson saying, why not 4D? Why are you saying 3D, that kind of thing. So then the origins of the 4D brand and this book, The Fourth Dimension and Non-Euclidean Geometry in Modern Art by Henderson um, really traces what Fuller was talking about up to a point, but she doesn't get all the way as far as quadrates. Like with, when she used quadrates, you can see that you could call space four dimensional. We've got four tuples as our coordinates, you know, it's another way of talking. It's another namespace. The thing people don't get as namespaces is people are allowed to use the word dimension in different ways, depending on what namespace they're in. And you don't have to, some, some immature arguments are, are like, if you don't mean what I mean by gravity, then you should say schmavity. But that's not how it works. It's like, we all want to use the same sexy words, like vertex and volume and power, vector. Anyway, so how quixotic is synergetics? Aren't we going up against an impossible foe, X, Y, Z, totally established? We have our little unit of volume out here. And, and I get to an XKCD cartoon. This guy is really funny and uh, is big in the Python worlds where I am too. And he makes jokes about Python programming. Anyway, these people are finding these windmills kind of ominous, kind of like grunch of giants kind of coming toward us. And behold, there's Don Quixote to the rescue. But the way I see it is I flip it around, windmills are us. In other words, this is kind of the new establishment math in a way. I mean, the Bucky stuff is very well established. You got stuff all over the world about this going. So it's not like, I think you're quixotic if you wanna fight this. If you think this is gonna go away somehow, then you're Don Quixote, because this is, this is, anyway. So, and then I thank Jay, Jay Baldwin at Applewhite, and that's, that's, that, that's the slideshow, right? So how do we go? Okay, I got like 10 minutes. Okay, and now I'm finally looking at the chat window. Uh, to an extent, I'm familiar with Tom Miller's work, yes. Quinturians, I've looked into those. Um, of course, I've coded those in Python and stuff. Let me try sharing a different screen. Like, quaternions are no mystery to me, but quadrates are not quaternions. They're much more like ordinary 3D XYZ coordinates. They're almost no different. So they're very familiar, and you can teach them to high schoolers. Right? You don't have to, this is not college in my book. So I'm gonna go, let's see. Is this where I wanna go? Okay. Let's move some windows around slightly. So I made a folder in Flickr regarding my chat today. And there's also a YouTube that goes before this one in my series. 
because I'm talking to my YouTube audience in theory too, because this is being recorded and I want to turn around and continue where we left off. There's stuff going on with Applewhite and Bonnie knows and who I also met a few times. He came out to Portland, Applewhite's visit Oregon. And this is a very weird thing that happened. This famous picture involving an American Express card. I actually got an email, not an email, a snail mail from American Express showing that they had seen my webpage where he came and visited me. It was just like, it was, <laughs> it was addressed to me by the title of my webpage. It could have been some somebody fell asleep at night, right? There's this letter, right? Applewhite's Visit Oregon from American Express. And that just happens to be my webpage about him coming out and hanging with us. There was, there was um, reason for that. I think he went to California a few times too. I always think of him as always in DC, but that's not true. So in terms of high school and school of tomorrow and like what I'm working on with synergetics right now, I'm working on this. This is the work environment of Jupyter Notebooks. In other words, I have code cells interspersed. See, I'm the author over here. And if I double click on any of these cells, it kind of takes me backstage to where I can edit and change things and add pictures. And then I can intersperse actual code. So like these are integer sequences from the online encyclopedia of integer sequences in Python. And what you're looking at is like, this is, you know, a high school curriculum you can say. But I actually know this is me writing synergetics, but it's right next to what I do for high schools, right? So algorithms, data structure, Mostly what I'm showing off is this whole Jupyter Notebook environment, which is free open source. And wouldn't you, if you were a high schooler, want to have this? And why are they making you buy uh, a Texas Instruments calculator for 120 bucks every year, right? It's like the schools call themselves public schools, but you know, do they even teach um, American heritage, i.e. all this stuff that I just went through? That's, you know, they're leading futurist. And he comes up with this really cool math and it's suppressed. So the way I get it across to kids is you weren't taught this and you're not going to be taught this. This stuff is really forbidden. Verboten math, I call it, right? So underground comics, you know, we get into that world of the subversive because, hey, open any textbook, it's not there. And, you know, kids can relate to that. One of the words I bandy about a lot is andragogy, andragogy, which goes with pedagogy. Pedagogy is techniques for teaching kids. Andragogy, it's a real word. I didn't make it up, but it's techniques especially useful with adults. And one of my funniest videos are my off the wall videos on YouTube. If you search on Pythonic, P-Y, Pythonic, andragogy. In other words, andragogy pertaining to Python, that's an interesting five minute YouTube. I'm very deep in the Python community. So a lot of what you're seeing is spreading out through this open source. You know, Portland is, used to brand itself on open source, maybe still does. And when O'Reilly's open source conference or convention was gonna move from Portland to San Jose, uh, that was a big deal for us. It's like our heart is being taken. But thanks to popular demand, it's now back in Portland. Of course, during COVID, we haven't had it live, but Portland got OSCON back. And I feel like in terms of open source, I'm saying these textbooks that I'm showing you and this very slideshow that we just went through are open source. And I'm including, I'm encouraging people to mix and match and make their own we don't have time for big publishers to decide this is worth teaching, right? It's not gonna happen. We have already waited 50, 40 years. So it's up to the open source people like me to share it. And so that's what I've been doing. So that's my talk, I think. I bet there's more about quadrays that I should say.
because they're pretty interesting. Yes, um, you do have some time to go into that a little more. Uh, and I think that's one of your more interesting um, trajectories. Okay. Um, so I have quadrays all implemented in Python. So it's, it's like you can just sit there interactively and type in a quadray coordinate, a vector. We give it four coordinates and then ask what's the X, Y, Z equivalent and it pops back and vice versa. So there's two way uh, conversion between X, Y, Z and quadrays. It's not a problem. If you lay the quadrays in one on top of each other of four points and take the determinant and multiply by a quarter, there's going to be your tetra volumes right out the, off the bat, right? No big deal. So what are quad rays? I explained them again, but here you see them in a Jupyter Notebook content context where you're actually running Python code. So if I go shift enter here, it's actually importing and just, well, there's a little star appearing here as it thinks about it, right? It's like my computer is $400 Mac Pro I got used, uh, still it should be a little faster than this, but there's a lot going on. And then I create four quadrays, and then you can do things like define the A module and the B module in terms of quadrays, and then just feed those edge lengths, or actually in this case, feed those quadray coordinates into a volume computer computation and get back the volume. And you can do that with the A module and the B module, you get back 124th, T module 124th, right? You just feed in the edges, you get back the volumes, it works. Or you feed in the coordinates. It all works in XYZ too. The thing about quadrays is, okay, you've got those four spokes like a caltrop from the center of the tetrahedron to its four corners. Linear combinations, in other words, two of one, one of another, one of another, and none of, a, of the fourth. So two of any of them, one of either of the others, and none of a fourth, there's actually 12 ways to do that, like 2110, 2101, 2011, like that, 1012. There's 12 combos. Those are the 12 spokes from the center of a ball to the 12 surrounding balls in the IBM. So you have all integer addresses for IBM balls around the center ball. Center ball could be 0000, zero, zero, zero and then those, like I say, all the points, the octahedron, the cube, they all have integer uh, quadra volumes, or excuse me, coordinate. Not only that, and here's something Robert Gray actually proved. Uh, imagine you have four turtles, four uh, gadgets that start at zero, 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 zero at the center, and every turn to play, they get to jump to a neighboring IBM ball, even back to the one they were just at, but they just jump you got 12, 12 to jump to, right? Any turn. And you do that a thousand times. So four of them all wander away from each other completely randomly. They always jump from ball to ball. So they are in IVM ball centers when they end up, which means they have whole number quadrate coordinates. Very nice. Turns out that the tetra volume of any of those random tetrahedrons, as long as their coordinates are the centers of IVM balls, has a whole number volume. Isn't that amazing? So all the Waterman polyhedra, which I really got into, they have whole number volume. All this whole subculture that is so underground, so underground, and that's what I'm talking about here, random tetrahedrons in the IVM. And it's all at my, I, I share this stuff as prolifically as I can, but it's still, and people don't know about this stuff. I think what I've discovered a lot is in Russia, especially, they all know who Haken is, Herman Haken, and he's now the father of synergetics on his own webpage. And people don't realize this American dude, this Buckminster Fuller, wrote a whole book on that called Synergetics. No, no, he just wrote operating manual, right? They don't, in Russian, it hasn't even been translated, synergetic. So people don't even know this stuff exists. But, um, you know, I'm out there sharing this presentation, and I think. YouTube and so on. I don't advertise. So my YouTube, I mean, I don't have commercials embedded in my YouTubes. I don't monetize, partly because I don't want to interrupt with commercials, but that I pay a penalty, I think, because YouTube can't make money off me that way. So, but once this stuff starts to become more established, I've got 
a thousand hours on it already on YouTube. So I feel like I'm ready for the larger audience that will probably come because this stuff's no brainer interesting, I think. I mean, we already have interest. Everyone's interested in Bucky, but they don't know synergetics very well. I think this all makes it much more open to anybody. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, if you're ready for question and answer already, um, it, uh, uh, we can take a five minute break and okay. uh, to stretch or to go to the bathroom, whatever bio break uh, is what we I'll refill it. my coffee cup. I'll be right yeah. back. You refill your coffee. Five minutes. We'll be back at 820. There's excellent questions in the chat box. Take a look at the questions uh, when you come back. And then so the top question and on down and then we'll finish the Q&A at uh, nine or 12 depending on where we all live. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you'll help me keep track of time, my screen is still being shared, is that true? Yes. Yes. All right, that's cool. I was gonna see if I could find, uh, let's see, where would it be? Um, I have a 4D solutions. This is where I would put stuff into chat. Like, you know, I'm having a fight with browsers because like Chrome now, if you just have a regular old HTTP, not HTTPS, it'll bite you tooth and nail to let you go there. Firefox <laughs> just puts a little padlock. I mean, I understand the difference. I'm a web guy, I know what they're saying, but it's like, you know, if you're not using encryption, it's kind of like reading the New York Times on the subway. Other people know what you're reading and they can just look at their copy if they wonder what you're reading. I mean, it's not like you need a secret encryption for everything. So I'm really against Google's heavy handed, making and it there's, hard. There's an extension for that, Kirby. You can get an extension to add to the Chrome browser that will bypass that. Okay, that's good advice. So with 4D solutions, you have to know the secret, which is click on the logo. And then you get a pioneer and open source, click on the logo again. And then you get another angle on my work, which is I created this thing called the Oregon Curriculum Network. You've got this little, it's old. You can see how it's certified by XHTML1. People don't even remember what that is, I'm sure. But I, there's a, a Google map of my house. You can see I'm not really shy about letting people know where I am. And this Oregon Curriculum Network gets into all kinds of stuff, one of which is where I implement quaternions and make a cube rotate and stuff. That was back in the days of applets, right? And then they kind of quashed that. But you've got a huge amount of Python and synergetics woven together in this page. So I'm just gonna cut and paste this into the chat window. And I'm gonna especially draw your attention to the Numery plus computer literacy series, which is again, kind of old by now, but I think shows where we're going because this idea of sphere packing to make shapes, that's figurate numbers and that's polyhedral numbers. And that's huge. I mean, that's not just Bucky doing sphere packing. There's um, a large literature, I would say Book of Numbers by Conway and Guy, Noman by Midhat Ghazale. So teaching a curriculum where we're looking for the patterns, the physical patterns relating to sphere packing in different ways, that is mainstream as it, as it gets. And the computer programs that you have to write to talk about those sequences are very, very short three lines, maybe recursive, maybe not. And so that need to do a hybrid of mathematics and computer science can be filled with this way of approaching geometry. And, you know, Pascal's pyramid, not just Pascal's triangle, get into phi, get into Fibonacci numbers. I'm doing that stuff to this day, right? I've always been, I used to be a math teacher, high school math teacher. 
I get on my YouTube channel, I say, think of me as a high school math teacher. And then I usually wear this hat because I'm also a Western guy and I'm also this Quaker guy. Partly I wanna show that Quaker schools had this stuff nailed decades uh, in front of everyone else. So I'm winning kudos for the Quakers here by teaching this stuff. It's leaving Jesuits in the dust. All right, so volume talk. Um, next question. Is there an equation for determine? Oh, the void. The void, yeah, the way I get to the voids are with the rhombic dodecahedron because it's tips, as you know. It has sharp tips and shallow tips. And those two types of tips are in different types of voids in the IVM. And Russell Chu and I would talk for hours about the four IVMs, how you can take the voids in an IVM and grow the balls in them to make an next IVM and how many are there total and make kind of a rolling pattern of four that, you know, because there's more voids than balls. So you can't just illuminate all the voids and get another IVM. No, either half the triangular voids or all the octahedral voids, uh, call them that. Okay, is there an equation for oh, uh, determining how many regular polyhedra can be constructed from the vertex coordinates within a regular end frequency octet tetrahedron? I don't know. Um, I've been looking at the number of edges as formulas. So as you grow an octet truss from the apex downwards, growing tetrahedron, we know how many balls there are on successive layers, right? But how many edges are you adding every time? So I've got some formulas for that. I haven't put them in OEIS yet. Um, I'm not, I don't put myself across as, oh, when I sent, let me see if I sent my, um, my URL that I just wanted to send for a second. I'm gonna send it to every, <clears throat> there. Um, you know, I'm not, when I said earlier, I'm, I'm uh, thinking of synergetics in the humanities. We're telling the world that um, I've coined the word STEMite. STEMite is you're in the STEM business. You're kind of an engineer of physics or somebody. The STEMites really can't read synergetics. They don't read metaphorically. They're too literal. So a lot of the delay in synergetics getting appreciated is that we didn't teach it in the literature department where it belongs, kind of James Joyce, you know. So I'm kind of stealing synergetics back from the engineers because I think they botched it in a lot of ways. We're gonna claim them for philosophy and be snobby like we used to be. We're gonna stay snobby. Which means this stuff is very platonic. I'm not doing anything really empirical here. In other words, there's no load bearing. This is all just a priori math, the quadres, all this volume stuff. The part of synergetics that I'm extracting here is the most sort of, um, I don't need to do any experiments because I can't, like I, I'm just a computer guy, right? It's just the math part that just works. And what David Kosky has helped do is bring back phi. So you get this, um, I just think beautiful set of identities. I'm trying to change to another Jupyter notebook, but you can express an S module as phi to the negative fifth power over two. How simple, that's the volume of the S module. And the E module is similarly simple. Once you get phi in there, all of your like volume tables, there's what I was talking about, the five scaled S modules, the beer mugs, there's a little one and a bigger one. And these are all totally specified uh, so you can 3D print them, right? So let's get those 3D printers going. People always wanna know what to do with their 3D printers. Well, here's some stuff. So all that stuff about the S module and that I also added to your, FSI website under geometry. I've got like four um, sections that I carved out that are gonna have um, all this stuff about quad race because I know it went by real fast. And then um, Martian math, this is storyboards where I talked about, you know, how I see this as a science fiction story. Um, that's been in circulation for quite a while. 
this idea of Martian math, the kind of branding around that. And then that becomes like kids are like, well, what's Martian math? Well, it turns out it's synergetics under the hood, but it is alien. It's very different from what they're used to, right? The way we do multiplication and all that. So I think the term is fitting, but here is where I think I have some better pictures of like, well, I thought I did. Yeah, these, right? I put these in your guys' folder as well in geometry, but this is where I wanna show how we do multiplication. Two times two times five, right, is 20. So the volume of this tetrahedron is just 20. So that's what we, we do in 4D. Uh, it's not like X, Y, Z where you're gonna you only use a right angle corner and you're not just gonna close the lid. You're not just gonna make a tetrahedron. When I do A times B times C in earthling math, you picture the corner of a room, like a right angled room. And then you build a whole prism. You build a rectilinear thing and you call that volume 20, a box, like a coffin. But with the tetrahedron way of doing it, the way the Martians do it, what you're looking at there is two times two times five. And it all makes perfect sense. And this is something Bucky uh, was really into um, and is not shared. We, we spend too much time just talking about once you're spinning these polyhedra, you get the domes and the spheres, but I wish we spent more time with the concentric hierarchy. So that's where I've specialized. Um, Do you get in uh, to uh, Archimedean solids? I, I know that uh, uh, Kepler was, was very deep into, uh, uh, you know, the, the type of uh, nested, uh, solids and, and so on. Yeah, I think Kepler foreshadows Bucky in having a nested hierarchy of polyhedrons. He just tried too quickly to map it to a specific special case thing, meaning orbits of the planets, right? And so everyone says he was wrong, but his intuition was to have something like that at the center of his microcosm. And Fuller has that, but like I say, it's a priori. We don't need it to map to the orbits or something, but um, the Archimedeans, the way I start, you start with the platonics, they're, you're, they're, we say there are five, but the tetrahedron is self-dual. So in a way, if you let them all play the dance of dual, they duel into each other, right? Octahedron duels to cube, cube to octahedron, pentagonal <laughs> dodec, you, you know that stuff, and tetrahedron to itself. But once you have two duels side by side, you converge them. I think of beget, make it biblical. I call it Genesis. And you, by converging the two duels, I mean, you intersect them on their edges, right? So when you intersect the cube and its dual, you get the rhombic dodecahedron, which fascinated Kepler and is, I believe, an Archimedean. No, it's not because, no, it is. It's got two different kinds of vertices. Is it Archimedean? It's certainly not a platonic. So the way we get out of the platonics is we marry, we intersect dual pairs. The rhombic dodecahedron, uh, uh, excuse me, the um, pentagonal dodecahedron and the icosahedron dual intersect to give rhombic tricontahedron, which is super important. We just went through. By the way, that, that five volume rhombic tricontahedron was slightly smaller radius. If you blow that up by three halves, so that its volume is 7.5, suddenly it has many vertices in common with the rhombic dodecahedron of volume six. So you've got this, this, this concentric hierarchy, even if it means nothing in terms of science, it's totally beautiful. Now it does mean stuff. It means all kinds of stuff, but just as a sculpture, and I could say it like a sculpture in a Zen garden in Kyoto is what I call it. I don't care if it means anything. It's some of the best geometry we have, I think, because it's so accessible, so accessible. Um, I have a question on the chat, and I wonder if I could just uh, clarify the question a little bit. Let me roll um, up. Did I miss yours? Because I'm looking. Yeah, uh, uh, it's about Morley, Frank Morley. Oh, there it is. I spaced I that spaced out. There. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I, I just, uh, I, I, my whole goal with synergetics is to try to marry it with what the nomenclature that we already know, and um, you know, Fuller 
who was good friends with Christopher Morley, who actually helped him <laughs> publish his very first book, uh, Nine Chains to the Moon. And his father taught at Johns Hopkins, Frank Morley. And Bucky was fascinated with Morley's theorem, where you can bring together into the center of a triangle or any asymmetrical tetrahedron, um, and you can get a regular tetrahedron in the center or a regular triangle. Um, uh, that is one of the ways of proving the importance of mites and the clarity of mites, uh, the whole, what you're discussing, uh, you do it so beautifully with volumetrics, but my question is, is that how would you teach it with referring to the nomenclature we already have with math and geometry? So does Morley's theorem work in tetrahedrons? Is there a way? How do you try yeah. Yeah, it's called trisector theorem. And it's for tetrahedrons, not just for triangles. Well, it, it keeps the, um, I should just read what Bucky said uh, in Synergetics. Uh, he, he said, Dr. Frank Morley, the three interior intersection points of the trisectors of any triangles, three angles will always describe an equilateral triangle. And um, he said that it, uh, this theorem is akin to the tetrahedral coordinate system, which we've just been talking about, of synergetics, uh, which describes how the superficial dissimilarities and aberrations of the tetrahedron in no way alter it, any of its constant symmetries of omnirational subdivision. So you're, you're really talking about all these different subdivisions, whether it's scaled to phi, as in Koski's, or whether it is the 10 module system that Yasushi Katakawa did. Um, so if you connect it to volume and then also connect it to certain theorems and then connect it to the, the known families of polyhedra, which would be, you were just talking about the Archimedeans and their duels. Well, their duels are the Catalans. Very few people know about the Catalans, but those are known geometric entities in, uh, in standard nomenclature. So that's why I was asking, have you embraced that perspective for uh, uh, the constant symmetries when you're dealing with asymmetry and symmetry? And growth? A, what your question is taking me to, am I back to my slides? Do you guys see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. I know there are passages in synergetics where he kind of holds an equilateral uh, triangle in front of your space or a tetrahedron, there we go, and distorts them, right? And he shows that actually triangles withstand skewing better. And then there's all the cheese tetrahedron stuff. Um, I think I would file your question under advantages of the tetrahedron, but then I'm still not sure where morally connects to the mite exactly. And But your real question is nomenclature yes. and how much See, I go the other way. I'm into no one else named the A module. You know, there's that 124th of a tetrahedron. It's simple. He calls it an A. I think no one else wants to condescend to use his terminology because he's an outsider. And we're the math people. You don't tell us what our nomenclature is going to be. Ergo, we are not going to use those words. We're not going to say A, B, T, E, or S. Even though you gave them great names, sorry, Bucky, you're not a card holding mathematician. We're not going to use your names. But I don't surrender that way. I say, no, we're just going to keep using these names. And we're going to bridge to the studies of Goldberg, Somerville, all those people who did study space filling tetrahedrons. And our high school kids are going to know more about space filling tetrahedrons because they learned about kit, cat, bite, and write, right? We taught that stuff. Our kids are smarter. See, we're in competition with those of you who won't use Bucky's vocabulary. We're gonna whip your ass. That's what we're gonna do. Thank you for that answer. Um, yeah. So Gary Doskus has two really important questions on more than two, but the two top ones about quaternions and also yeah. about the voids are, uh, I'd like you to address those questions. Well, I did, I did talk about those. Oh, both of them? Yeah, I've done quaternions and I'm aware of what they are. They're, they're yeah. different quadrates, right? They use imaginary or, you know, they're the, the Hamiltonian stuff. 
they're more difficult. What happened with quaternions, if you study the history of linear algebra, you know, Hermann Grassmann, and I think this stuff I'm doing, by the way, this closing the lid operation where you kind of do web, uh, by web, I mean like a duck's web feet, you just close the lid, you call that the product. I'm sure there's going to be an algebra named that. I don't know what. Quadres are the beginning of something. It's maybe a Clifford algebra. I don't know what. I'm not a math guy, really. I'm a philosophy guy. But I know that this is the beginning of something, and Fuller will get some credit for this stuff, even though quadrays are not in synergetics. There was another guy named Clifford Nelson, and I think he was embarrassed that Fuller talked a lot about a coordinate system, but there was no computational alternative to XYZ actually in synergetics. And he kind of made it seem like his thing, he came up with his version of 4D coordinates that he called synergetics coordinates. And I thought that was rather forward because it's not there and you can't retroactively make it be there. And I didn't think it was very elegant. So Clifford Nelson and I, we diverged and I called these quadra coordinates, but they didn't come from me. There was this whole long listserv I was on, Gerald DeJong, David Chaco, um, this other guy says he invented them. And I don't try to mediate because I think the zeitgeist is that way a lot of people think of great ideas at the same time. And the game of who thought of it first is a game and not necessarily that interesting, right? The game of priority. That goes back to where you need patrons and we're all starving to death and you got to prove you came up with it first. So you get to sit next to the king and eat his roast beef and not that other guy. So coming from scarcity, we have to prove who's first, but I don't think that's a priority uh, with synergetics. There's a lot of stuff in there that is not Bucky's discovery, and I don't think that's important. Right? But that's that's why it's so critical to connect Fuller's work to standard nomenclature and standard perspectives. Like, for instance, the quaternion question could be moved over to the octonian question. And, you know, E8 Lee groups and, you know, uh, Garrett Lisi's idea that, you know, the universe, that's really the the framework of the universe in 4D and how do you make Bucky synergetics fit into that and what parts of it are unique and what parts aren't. There is a notion, uh, it's already <laughs> described, I, I have it in my geoscope, my longer geoscope essay you haven't seen. Um, in any case, it's called the principle of multiple discovery. And we have that with, uh, with, there's a lot of examples in history of that. So extracting Fuller's synergetics from what is known and what isn't to describe the importance of his discoveries, you're already doing that in certain ways, but there are many other points of contact that we could make. To, totally, to and I agree with you. I mean, I took a polemical, I took a polemical stance and said, we're going to use his vocabulary, but ultimately it is about building bridges, like you said. And the Arthur Loeb showed how to do that, you know, to crystallography and that we've done. And the Buckminster Fullerene breakthrough, just naming it that, you know, that really helped. Um, it's, it's, it's not always neologisms either, like isotropic vector matrix. Those are all intelligent words that do make sense used that way. I mean, it's not that he invented any of those three words, but yet we say it's Bucky's weird way of talking, but it's not really a neologism. So uh, the A8 and the B modules, those qualify, I think, as invented words. But the thing about isotropic vector matrix is it abbreviates to IVM, which is very close to XYZ. In other words, you can, I have these spreadsheets where I'll have the XYZ coordinates in three columns, and then I'll have IVM coordinates, as I sometimes call quadrays, in four columns. But they resonate, IVM, XYZ, they look good together. And I always say that, that we're here to stabilize the cube, not to slay it. In other words, I don't think there's anything about XYZ that's wrong or has to go. It's not we're here to clean up. It's we're here to sort of share the driver's uh, chair. Like we can help, you know. <laughs> we're, we're a separate subculture, but, um, you know, <clears throat> I think 
I think some of Fuller's nomenclature should stick. I think the mite in particular, there is no other word for it and it's dissection into two A's and one B is not done by other authors. So what? why would we not want to use mite, right? And it stands for minimum tetrahedron. It's like, it's so perfect. It's a good design. So I would push at least some of his vocabulary, but not dogmatically and not all of it. Right. That's a good approach. Yes. Um, Gary had Gary had a question. Also, I don't know that you really addressed because uh, it connects to his very unique uh, work that he's doing now. Is have you explored the void that exists in the center of a tetrahedron, the void created by the four spheres <clears throat> at the four vertices? <clears throat> <laughs> yes, and then his question at the end about a simulator, which having looked at some of his stuff, uh, probably means something more than I understand simulator. Because, you know, rendered um, in ray tracing, that's what I'm, my speed is, I use Python to write scene description language, which is then in turn rendered by POV ray. And, and then Blender is an all Python animation suite that is complicated. And if I'd started to learn it a long time ago, I'd be good at it by now. But as it is, I find myself exhorting people on my YouTube channel, look at all these wonderful graphics I'm not doing, <laughs> but you can imagine, right? And as far as the voids inside, yeah, I was talking about the rhombic dodecahedron that Kepler so loved, because he knew it was a space filler. There's an Arthur Kessler biography of Kepler, and it focuses a lot on his focus on the rhombic dodecahedron. So I always think of the rhombic dodecahedron as Kepler-esque. And I think of synergetics in a way as, if you think of a mixing board where like you're boosting frequencies, you know, pushing these levers up and down like people do, he's pushing the rhombic dodecahedron and pulling back on the pentagonal dodecahedron big time because we all think in terms of platonics, we grow up with platonics, Archimedeans, Catalan, we get this like classification system, nothing wrong with it. I teach database science that way, put all the polyhedrons in a database and fish them up by tags. And it's relational tables, so you gotta have their coordinates. You can do so much with object-oriented programming and polyhedron, they're concretely objects, and yet they're also very abstract. But in terms of, Fuller's classification, the, the voids, you know, he draws them. Synergetics has moldings of these octahedral voids and tetrahedral voids. The corners of the rhombic dodecahedron all terminate in these voids. So that's one way I approach them. Also the C60, I work with Sam Lanahan a lot. These soccer balls all attach to each other to create a lattice he calls, uh, C60 lattice. I have it in front of my house. It's very attractive. And I've used it in workshops. And it gives you a sense of the different kinds of voids. And, you know, the, the, there's nothing like building this stuff with your hands, as everyone says, and flying through it in virtual reality. That kind of simulation, virtual reality, real early, I tried, I did, I got into VRML, virtual markup and stuff. And of course, I'm excited about you know, the possibility of VR and all this stuff too. I see a bright future for all of this stuff. And that's why I think I don't play on the defensive anymore. I think this, this stuff, the inertia behind this is so unstoppable. That's great. It's just glacial. It's slow. It's as slow as it is unstoppable. Nothing I can do about it. It's like, it's not, in, I'm not in charge. I'm just riding this glacier, yeehaw, pretending like it's, my glacier. <laughs> hey, hey, Kirby, yeah, my question uh, regarding that, like a simulator, um, it's just something I've been recently playing with, uh, Unity as a game engine, right? And what I found really fascinating about it was, uh, actually Joe Clinton showed me how to use Poveray last year. So oh, cool. I got, in, got into rendering a bit, which was real interesting. Very cool. But I still like the hands-on 3D modeling and then when I came across um, Unity Game Engine, it has a built-in physics simulator. Right, that's what you meant. Okay, well, yeah, that's yeah. cool, because that's really more what I mean too. Um, yeah, physics engine built in and stuff. Where I look at with Unity and what's the other one, Unreal 3D or something? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, 
I've been really tracking the meme of an all hexagons, 12 pentagons world. Like why isn't civilization? Because that hexagonal tiles is kind of the norm for a board game civilization type games. They all use hexagons. That's gone for a long time. Tank games, uh, war games, all them. You put that on a sphere, you need your pentagons, right? But where's the game that explicitly is built on a hexapent, as I call them, a Goldberg, a certain type of Goldberg. And so I track that meme and I find a lot of Unity artists on YouTube are sharing their complete hexapent globe generating algorithms. So we're getting closer and closer to that being a default because it's so much cooler than lat long. Lat long is not squares, it's trapezoids and they get so thin and tiny towards the poles. You know, hexapens are just a funner game experience. So that's where I'm at with Unity and stuff. And you know, the, the, the concentric hierarchy, I just go on YouTube every so often and type in concentric hierarchy and I see if anyone's doing it, right? I think any art school, you know, it's like drawing nudes. It's like, this is such basic geometry. Why don't we all go through a concentric hierarchy talk in art school? It only has to be half an hour, but it should be there. This stuff is so, I think, classic. And the fact that it's being sat on and not shared with kids, I have to use that to my advantage. I have to say, look, the adults are not letting you in on this. The days are going by, tick, tick, tick. It's not a tuition forgiveness you want. You need a tuition refund. So that's my rhetoric. Um, I want to clarify something and then open up to any other questions that anybody may have. When you were talking about the rhombics, uh, Bill Becker used to uh, say that uh, that Bucky called those spherics. He never really got into them, never cared about them because uh, he saw them as interspheres because in the family of polyhedra, as it's growing, the rhombics are in between everything. Rhombics are sort of the ghosts of the concentric hierarchy. Yep. And I like they should, it. I think, like you were saying, the platonic uh, ideal of the uh, pentagonal dodecahedron is not the place. It's really with the parallel pipeds or the um, diamond face rhombics that we should clarify how those fit into this con concentric hierarchy. And Bucky never got to that place with it. However, Duncan Stewart, who did his first manuscript called Energetic Geometry in 1951, uh, he, he started with the sphere and he was a, an expert on the sphere and he was known as an expert on the sphere. So I think, uh, I think Bucky had some areas where we could fill in the blanks of that concentric hierarchy. So we have uh, five more minutes uh, and uh, anybody else who's here who hasn't asked a question on the chat and would like to ask Kirby another question? While I'm watching the chat, I will say, having reread Cosmic Fishing recently and thinking about when it was written, which is sort of before Synergetics 2, Synergetics, Bucky's on the quest for what is my volume five? He's got a, you know, he's got his concentric hierarchy, but he doesn't have a five and he knows he wants one. And he comes to a sphere spinning at real high speed or something like that. And kind of when synergetics fades out, he's got the, the sphere is somehow his, his crown jewel. And it's cosmic fishing, you've got echoes of that. But then in synergetics two, he, he does a retraction. He basically, has to, in, in his prose, he talks about, well, I got a hip replacement and I had to replace, I had to write to this math guy that I was wrong. And another guy made a, a thing of water and brought it to me to show me I was wrong. It's like everyone, Bucky, you're, you're wrong about the sphere. And that's when he stumbles on the T module, the E module, the rhombic trichondahedron, all of that stuff is in Synergetics too. And he talks about his subconscious demon that got him off on the wrong foot. And, you know, again, if you haven't read Synergetics deeply, that kind of just goes gone. We're reading this book called uh, Architecture in the Ra Age of Radio over on the Trim Tab Book Club. And I wanted to say this guy, Mark Wigley, who wrote this book, gives one of the best talks on Bucky I've ever seen. And you've probably seen it, you guys. But if you haven't, 
it's only got like 4,000 views and it's just a talk, but it's about Diamaxian bathroom, especially. And it's about pipes. If you go to YouTube and type pipeless or pipes and um, Mark Wigley, amazing talk. And, and Bonnie, back to your rhombic dodecahedron, what we're looking, what I'm looking for is somewhere in synergetics and I haven't found it yet. He says, quote, the rhombic dodecahedron must be the first radio. And to me, that sounds like what you just said about ghost of the IBM, right? And I want to find that and think about it more. The voids, right? It connects the voids. Um, I, I will put that link to the talk. Uh, Wigley's book is one of the best books out there. Alec Navala Lee's biography will be coming out this year, and that will be the best biography ever of Bucky, the most comprehensive. And I think that we should we should all feel free to put some of our favorite talks or uh, books onto Mighty Networks to share with others. Very good idea. A lot of action on that with TrimTap Book Club, as you imagine, because it's a book club. And we have a guy named Brett who is super, super into e-publishing anything and everything he can get permission to do, including, okay, he got cosmic fishing quite far along. And then Applewhite's daughter said, you know, this is exactly what we want, but we're going to take it over and make it perfect. So but just he's catalyzing the process where more and more of the Bucky things are being made electronically available, which has many advantages, including searchability, right? You just search for keywords, stuff like that. Um, and I see Bo's question about, have I heard more of Chaco space after the 1990s? I've lost track with David Chaco. We used to call the Caltrop coordinates or quadrate coordinates. He called them tetrae coordinates, or I called them after him, Chekovian coordinates, because that sounded very mathy, sounded Bourbakian, right, Chekovian coordinates, you know, just the right amount of obscurity. But I haven't, um, David Chaco was some vice president of something in, I find a lot of the best mathematicians are bored out of their mind vice presidents in financial situations, like in New York City. They have a high paying job, they're sitting in a nice office, and they have nothing better to do except do synergetics. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other further questions? I just want to say the Sinel group that we were in in the 90s and all the way into the 2000s with the virtual world, the virtual high school, Dave Chaco or Chaco was uh, amazing. And I printed out all of that stuff. I can't find it online, the, the you know, the Sinel uh, archives. I don't think it exists online, so I'm really glad I printed those out. A lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Bonnie. That's the archivist instinct, which is so valuable. I wanted to say that the math forum, I was exulting about how in the heyday of quadrate coordinates at the math forum, I had this banner. I didn't even do this page. Somebody respected the quadrates as a topic enough to put this banner here. I'm almost there that. So the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, here's another my, one of my stories. They used to have an octet truss as their logo way back, like probably still in the 80s. And I remember writing them a memo, like something like, hey, that's great. Your logo's just what we need because um, Bucky Bucky. And it wasn't so long that they changed their logo now to this infinity symbol. And I don't think they're very friendly to a lot of public discourse at all. Just, we argued on the math forum, what was called, uh, for 10 years, just all kinds of people. It wasn't just me by any means. It was all kinds of people with strong agendas, but it was very robust town square, kind of democratic, everyone said what they want. And NCTM moved in, took over the whole thing from Drexel, who had got it from Swarthmore. And we were warned this was gonna happen. They shut it all down. There is no math forum and there is no public debate. So I did get to keep an archive copy of like what I wrote because they warned us in advance, like I said, and sent us our stuff. This was the Drexel people who saw what was coming. But again, verboten math. I mean, there is no free debate in this country. Very post-democracy. They, they just destroyed it all. 10 years of writing on my part, gone. And it would have all been there in public. Now I don't have to defend it as the thing. 
sometimes when all your acting history is gone, you can start over. It's like, well, no one's seen me in my bad play because <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> so in a way, it's kind of a cleansing of the record. But no, I regret that they did that. So Kirby, thank you for um, your talk. We usually do a hard stop at nine, uh, also noon. And um, but, however, uh, if anybody has a burning question, needs to stay. Some people do usually have to go. Um, please go ahead and ask now. I, I, uh, I, I have. Go ahead. No, no, please. I, would, I just All want right. to. Re, I want to remind everyone that if you choose to begin discussing these matters on our Mighty Networks group, that you do it inside of a group and not on the feed page so that we can collect comments and port them over to the other website when the time comes. Have I said that clearly? Put all your comments in a yeah. group on Mighty Networks. If there's a group which you would like to have created, just let me know and I'll create the group. That's all I got. Harold, you, you had a question? Oh, sorry. Well, I, I was just going to say or, or ask, uh, I, I read somewhere that, uh, uh, that Bucky said, uh, wrote, that uh, he was a, a great critic of the uh, patent system, patent system, the U.S. patent system, because he thought it really did not protect most people from uh, from you know uh, failure uh, when they uh, created uh, good uh, new ideas, and he said, uh, therefore, the only reason he uh, 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 got a lot of things patented is so that he could keep a nice legal uh, record of what he came up with when. I guess my question, therefore, is: Have have you heard? Uh, uh, because I, you know, I wouldn't know where to find it. I've tried uh, where where uh, Bucky criticizes uh, the U.S. patent system. Um, that's a really good question because I agree with you. He's suspicious of sort of the way we do intellectual property but he's trapped in a way to make his point of what one individual can do. He's going to document everything he's ever done. And, you know, otherwise it'll be taken from him and he'll die in obscurity. So he's both fighting intellectual property and capitalizing it uh, at the same time, but exactly where he criticizes the patent system. You know, I would go to synergetics dictionary maybe because it's online and look under P because that's where he, that Synergetics Dictionary, as you know, by Applewhite, four volumes made from eight by five note cards, much the way Synergetics was made, um, is indexed or dictionary lookup by very specific words. And searching the Bucky corpus for specific quotes is a daunting task. Thank you. Uh, an answer. An answer to that last question. This is Joe. Back when I was at Southern Illinois University, he gave a presentation to a group of students. And that presentation included his criticism of the patent office that I recall. Yes, and more than likely, that's in one of the uh, uh, recordings that uh, is either at the uh, Stanford collection or could be in the Southern Illinois University collection. But I recall him saying that during one of his, uh, his talks. Thank you. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about priority and starving and needing to prove your first. Uh, you know, if you're Ramana John, what are your chances now? He did get noticed, but I'm always thinking there's, you know, a billion Ramana John geniuses running around who are never going to get credit and yet have thought of all kinds of amazing stuff. It's like, it takes a lot of money to be a patent holder, you know, to get one to go through the lawyers and stuff. 
So it's it, it rewards people who already have advantages. So all that kind of stuff, but that's just me talking, right? But I'm, I'm an open source guy. So I'm into copy left, not copy right. So, oh, Gary, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kirby, I just wanted to share an observation with you to get your, um, your, your opinions on it. I, I did some work with um, something similar to the A mod, B mod that, that Bucky used. But I, but I, I, I used an A module, which is identical, but I called it Tetra module. And then an Octa module was, was an A plus B module, where the, where the A module would con, can construct the octahedron. And when you combine those structures together in a space filling nature, what, what I found interesting is they define 13 planes, you know, that include, you know, the three planes of the cube and the four planes of the, octa, the tetrahedron and the six planes of the rhombic dodecahedron in a nice array of planes that cleanly def define each of those irregular tetrahedrons. And, 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 and so that I made a magnetic toy out of it that slices in any one of those 13 planes, which I found interesting. That sounds, toys are a great way that a lot of these things end up. This one I use a lot. This is all magnetic and it's a cube made of mites, right? But the mites don't come apart into A's and B's. And, you know, I think Fuller felt under pressure because the zeitgeist was moving on and a lot of us were creating these concepts and he wanted to get it in writing so that what he meant by A and B could at least be there because I have seen at least one other book. What is it? Forms and structure, whatever. That book has some A and B talk in it. And the B there does include the A. It's not separate, it's uh, encompassing or whatever. So I think <clears throat> Fuller fell under pressure to get his nomenclature out there because there's a tsunami coming, right? I think. You know, we're getting more, I think, back into right brain visualization is what's happening. Bourbaki was all about purge math of anything visual is get rid of it, right? It's a crutch, it's not real. And, you know, Mandelbrot and the fractals are the swing of the pendulum back the other way. And I think Bucky is part of that larger trend that we're getting more comfortable with our own imaginations again, as opposed to what happened uh, with Bourbaki and so on, right? So I, I think there's a bright future here is what I'm saying. I, I can get polemical about it, but really there's no need. I need to sort of tone it down probably, but it's been a long haul, right? I'm like a 50 year veteran with like battle scars. So. <laughs> anyway. so, um, it's 10 after nine. Um, we should stop, but I think Al had one I, more question. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually not mathematically oriented. Uh, Kirby, um, I, I look at Mighty Networks as a, a resource projecting forward, hoping to have a larger pool of people into it that would be able to search. I wanted to get your permission to um, to, to reference, promote your, your club's videos, links and such um, in, in just general discussions. And if that's okay with you, because yeah. I think that's part of that projection, but I, but I wanted to ask you and, you know, to make sure that was okay. See, if everything went according to plan, you would all now steal my PowerPoint slides and make YouTubes out of them. By the next week, <laughs> yeah, I have, to, I have to. I have to play them a hundred times and about two times slower. I'm looking forward to doing that. Oh my God! Don't do that. Two times <laughs> faster. I think uh, I've listened to a lot of YouTube's on double speed, and I think it works for a lot of people. Um, yeah, thanks. You know, Casey House is somebody I want to just say out loud. He's done a lot of work. New generation synergetics. His art is superb. He's got what he calls Sinu Synergetics University. He's been around the world. Uh, he's interesting character and I've never met him in person, but <clears throat> I, I would like to help you guys recruit uh, new people to your network, but uh, I'll, I'll bide my time because I've only just joined. So I don't want to be out front. I'm not, I'm not a front man yet because I don't know enough, but thank you for inviting me. And thank you for letting me be here. It's been cool. a pleasure. Thank you very much. Kirby. Thank you for coming. All right. Yeah. Send me that video whenever you get a chance. I'll notify you when it's available. You can download it then. All right. Along with the uh, transcript. 
All right. Thank you all, guys. I'm saving the chat now. And I'll meet you next time. Thanks, Kirby. All right. See you all right. Soon. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Next week. So long, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. That was awesome. <laughs>